Thank you for coming by, cruising by for my daily devotions. The 16th day, it's Monday of uh, September 2024. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Acts chapter 9, Psalm 51, and Nehemiah chapter 9. Second chapter of Corinthians, which well, first chapter of Corinthians we read yesterday, starting at verse 18. This is so important. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It always wanders back to the cross somehow. It always gets back to what Jesus paid for us on Calvary 2,000 years ago. The, the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And... Um, we always want to stay focused on the cross and what Jesus paid there. Let's pray. Father, speak to us. Change our lives by what we hear from you today and make us different because of your word. And change our hearts, Father, by what we hear in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Second chapter of 1 Corinthians. So it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Christ Jesus and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise or, and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God has des destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thought except that their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. Explaining spiritual realities with spiritual, with, with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgment about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And then Acts chapter 9. This is, We're going to run into the conversion of Saul of Tarsus in this chapter. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. He replied, now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into, into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name 
to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God, and all those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on your name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest. Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days he had gone, had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not just not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. That's what's supposed to happen. That's the stuff that's supposed to happen. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas who was paralyzed and who had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up, roll up your mat. Immediately Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Lydda there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time she became sick and died and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter went with, Peter sent them all out of the room, then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is the psalm that David wrote after he was confronted by Nathan the prophet over his sin with Bathsheba getting her and having her husband killed. And it is a psalm of repentance. And it's phenomenal, actually. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb and taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. 
Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are my God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your praise, of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Do not, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, O oh, you, God, will not despise. May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous, in burnt offerings offered whole, and bulls will be offered on your altar. And then Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. This comes up right after they read the law, uh, the book of, of God to the folks, and uh, all kinds of good things happen. On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. Some of the Israelites had separated themselves from, from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. They stood, stood where they where they were and read the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and in worship of the Lord their God. Standing on the stairs of the Levites were Jeshua, Bani, Cadmiel, Shebaniah, Buni, Sherebiah, Bani, Kenai. They cried out with a loud voice to the Lord their God and the Levites, Jeshua, Cadmiel, Bani, Heshebaniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Sheb Shebaniah, and Pethiah said, Stand up and praise the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord, whom you made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything and to the multitudes of heaven and the multitudes of heaven worship you. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out from Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful to you and you made a covenant with him to give his to his descendants the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Girgashites. You have kept your promise because of your righteousness. Because, because you are righteous. You saw the suffering of, of our ancestors in Egypt. You heard their cry at the Red Sea. You sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh and against all his officials and all the people of his land. For you knew how arrogantly the Egyptians treated them. You made a name for yourself which remains to this day. You divided the sea before them so that they passed through it on dry ground. But you buried their pursuers in, into the depths like a stone into mighty waters. By day you led them with a pillar of cloud and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light on the way that they were to take. You came down to Mount Sinai. You spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and laws <clears throat> that are just and right and decrees and commands that are good. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and gave them commands, decrees and laws through your servant Moses. In their hunger, you gave them bread from heaven, and in their thirst, you brought them water from the rock. You told them to go in and take possession of the land you had sworn with up, uplifted hand to give them. But they, out, <clears throat> but they, our ancestors, became arrogant and stiff-necked, and they did not obey your commands. They refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. They became stiff-necked and in their rebellion appointed a leader in order to return to their slave to return to their slavery. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Therefore you did not desert them. Even when they cast for themselves an image in the, of, of a calf and said, This is your God who brought you up out of Egypt, or when they can, committed lawless, awful blasphemies. Because of your great compassion, you did not abandon them to the, to the wilderness. By day, the pillar of cloud did not fail to guide them on their path, nor the pillar of fire by night to shine on the way they were to take. You gave your good spirit to instruct, you gave your good spirit to instruct them. 
You did not withhold your manna from their mouths, and you gave them water from the, for their thirst. For 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, nor did their feet become swollen. You gave them kingdoms and nations, allotting to them even the remotest frontiers. They took over the country of Sihon, king of Heshbon, and the country of Og, king of Bashan. You made their children as numerous as the stars in the sky, and you brought them into the land that you told them their parent you, you told their parents to enter and possess. Their children went in and took possession of the land. It's Canaan, okay? You subdued them before the Canaanites who lived in the land. You gave the Canaanites into their hands along with their kings and the peoples of the land to deal with them as they pleased. They captured fortified cities and fertile land. They took possession of houses filled with all kinds of good things, wells already dug, vineyards, olive groves, and fruit trees in abundance. They ate to the full and were well nourished. They, re they reveled in your great goodness. But, when, but, but they were disobedient and rebelled against you. They turned their back on your law. They killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you. They committed awful blasphemies. So you delivered them into the hands of their enemies who oppressed them. But when they were oppressed, they cried out to you. From heaven you heard them, and in your great compassion you gave them deliverers who rescued them from the hand of their enemies. But as soon as they were at rest, they again did what was evil in your sight. Then you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they ruled over them. And when they cried out to you again, you heard from heaven, and in your compassion you delivered them uh, time after time. You warned them in order to turn back, turn them back to your law, but they became arrogant and disobeyed your commands. They sinned against your ordinances, and which of which you said, the person who obeys them will live by them. Stubbornly they turned their backs on you and became stiff-necked and refused to listen. For many years you were patient with them, but, your, but by your spirit you warned them through your prophets, yet they paid no attention. So you gave them into the hands of their neighbor, neighboring peoples. But in your great mercy you did not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Now therefore, our God, the great God, mighty and awesome, who keeps his covenant of love, do not let all this hardship seem trifling in your eyes. The hardships that have come on us, on our kings and leaders, and on our priests and prophets, on our ancestors and all your peoples from the days of the kings of, of Assyria until today. In all that has happened to us, you have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully while we acted wickedly. Our kings, our leaders, our priests, our ancestors did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commands or to the statutes you warned them to keep even while they were in your kingdom, enjoying your great goodness to them in the, in the spacious and fertile land you gave them, they did not serve you or turn from your evil ways. But see, we are slaves today, slaves in the land you gave our ancestors so they could eat its fruit and the other good things it produces. Because of our sins, its abundant harvest does, goes to the kings you placed over, it, over us. They rule our, over our bodies and our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. In view of all this, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders, our Levites, and our priests offering their seals to it. They're going to sell out to Jesus, to the Lord, who would eventually be Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thanks for speaking to us. Change our lives by what we heard and make us different today because we heard from you is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.